Amen. What a great chapter. I didn't say it out loud, but the whole time he's reading, I'm like, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It'd be okay if we if we did that out loud every once in a while, but I was feeling it inside for sure. <clears throat> you know, uh, real quickly, background Romans. Many already know the, the layout of, of it, but uh, chapter 1 is dealing with the Gentiles. Unbelievers, rejected God, just living in sin, wickedness, and paganism, going after other uh, idols and stuff like that. And and uh, then, of course, famous uh, portion of Scripture there where it talks about those who have just totally rejected God, turned over to a reprobate mind. And we understand that from Romans 1. Then it starts off right off the bat in chapter 2. And he's addressing primarily the the, Jew, the Jews of that day. Or not the Jews, but the, uh, uh, yeah, those who should know better. The Jews primarily, but of course, he's, he's trying to make them all Christians. But uh, primarily the Jews saying that you should know better, but look, you're judging the Gentiles and the wicked things they do and all the, the you know, all manners of, of wickedness. He's saying, but you're just as guilty because you continue to walk in sin and, uh, and doing those things. And so uh, then, of course, he drops into chapter three, one of the best soul winning chapters in the Bible. And in chapter three, he says, look at verse 24 there. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And that's where inside I was shouting amen whenever you read that because uh, that's, that's the gospel, right? That's what we want to uh, uh, tell people. But I want to draw your attention in this chapter to verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4 says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? <laughs> it's kind of funny, like, you know, you talk to people sometimes and they'll act like, you know, well, I, I don't believe that. Okay, it doesn't make it not true, <laughs> you know, because you don't believe it. What if they don't believe it? Should their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. You know, I, I don't even like that verse because, I, I mean, I, I, I love the verse, but in my flesh, I don't like that verse because you know what that verse is saying? I'm a liar. <laughs> and I stand up here as a pastor. Last thing I want to do is tell you I am capable of lying, probably lied to you before. Man, that's hard to say, <laughs> but it's true. The Bible says, let all men be a liar, okay? Don't ever look at me and say, hey, Brother Rocky will never do, you know, he'll never steer me the wrong way. No, you need to look at God and say, God will never steer me the wrong way. Brother Rocky's just a man. He's fallible. He could be a liar too. Let all men be liar. Now, I don't want you to look at me like a liar, but you understand what I'm saying. God be true and every man a liar. I don't care if the Apostle Paul himself was standing here preaching to you. You better check with what he says with the, with the Bible, Amen. right? And so I want to talk tonight about the word testimony. What is testimony? The title of the message is God's testimony and our testimony. God's testimony and our testimony. So there's only two points to the message. I imagine you could probably figure out what those two points are. God's testimony and our testimony, all right? Let's talk about the word testimony, first of all. Look at Genesis chapter 24. I'm going to show you something. You may know this. You may not know this. I'm going to try not to be inappropriate. But uh, I just think it would be something interesting for us to know. It is said. Now, there's some speculation. Nobody really knows the, orig the origination of this uh, word. But testimony comes from the word testes. And you say, well, that's weird. It is weird. And every time I've ever read this verse in the Bible, I've said, that's weird. Genesis 24, verse 2. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Now, they might have did that back in the Bible days, but if someone asked me to do that now, no, that's okay. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Put your hand under my thigh. I never knew what that meant. Where's the thigh? You know, this is the thigh, hand under the thigh. What does that mean? I've got some, uh, uh, some thoughts about that, what it might mean. Look at chapter 47. We see it again. 47, verse 29. And I'll let you look up the etymology yourself and see if I'm right. 47, 29. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. 
and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. So he's making a covenant with them, and he's saying as a, as a, 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 to signify, you know, to seal this covenant, uh, I want you to make an oath, kind of like putting your hand on the Bible or raise your right hand. You know, if you're a scout or something like that, <laughs> you know, there, there's these different ways of saying, here's how we're going to seal this deal. And that day, they would put their hand under the thigh. Now, I don't know where at exactly on the thigh, but I know this in the Jewish uh, culture, uh, there is even to this day a part of the thigh that they won't eat. Look at uh, Genesis 32. Genesis 32, verse 25. This is where uh, Jacob is wrestling with an angel. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of the joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thee bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for a prince thou ha uh, hast thou power with God and with men, uh, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the place, uh, the, the place called the name of the place Peniel, and he said, uh, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. Uh, wherefore, the children of Israel eat not of the sinew uh, which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, uh, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. So the hollow of the thigh has to do with where the, the hip joint goes into the hip, right? And so you're talking about... An area, if you'll just allow me to say that a man would think of, maybe the Bible uses the word loins sometimes, and, the, and that he would think of, hey, this is, so if I'm making a covenant with somebody, I'm basically, it, it, this is my understanding of this, basically like saying, you know, on my children, right? I'm, I'm, I'm giving this testimony on my children or on my ability to procreate. You know, and that kind of stuff. And that might be something that you didn't know about this word. But that word testimony is somehow linked to that. And it's really strange. And a lot of people have puzzled over that, tried to make it mean something else because it seems too weird. But when we read the Old Testament, we say, well, I mean, that's uh, we're seeing some things that might uh, might lead us down that road. But the th idea is that the testimony, the testimony, if you think about that in that sense, it's a legal, like a binding contract that somebody telling the truth about something. They're saying, I'm good. I am upholding that this is true. And it's very important that I uphold this truth. Okay. You stand on the witness stand. What are you doing? You're going to give your testimony, right? That's what they're going to say. It's a legal term. Somebody's giving their testimony. So first I want to talk about God's testimony. Turn to Psalm 119. God's testimony. We know this. God's word is his testimony. When we pick up this Bible, we read God's word, we are reading his testimony. You know, he's testifying of some things. He's letting us know uh, his mind on some things. And uh, Psalm 119 is a great example of this. You're probably familiar with this. Every verse in this chapter says something about God's word, whether it is talking about, man, I got to stop talking and find my spot here. Whether it's talking about his commandments, the law, his precepts, covenant, there's different words that are used. So let me just take you through a few of these. We won't do all of them because there's a whole bunch. But look at verse 2. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Okay, so David's writing this about God's word, and he's calling it his testimonies. And that seek him with their whole heart. Look at verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Verse 22. Remove from me reproach and contempt. For I have kept thy testimonies. Okay, it's another word for law, the word of God. You know, what he's telling us to, uh, to do and, and what, is, what is true and not true. Thy testimonies, verse 24, also are my delight and my counselors. Verse, let's see, 39, uh, 36, incline thine ear 
unto thy testimony, I'm sorry, incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Over and over we see this, verse 46, I will speak of thy testimonies also before uh, kings, and I will not be ashamed. Verse 59, I've probably skipped some. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. And we're not even halfway through, but you keep going on. I've got them all marked in red. And so there's a, a, a bunch of them. In fact, it was kind of neat. One time I did a little, uh, I was studying this chapter and I said, I'm going to count for myself how many times these different words are used. So I put law and every time it comes across the, the word law in that chapter, I put a little check mark. And I didn't realize, but it was going to go off the page, just rows of check marks. And then testimony, same thing, precepts, statutes, and commandments. But man, what a great chapter. And what you see in that chapter is David's love for God's word. He said, I hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against God. And he, he just loved God's word. And he calls it his testimony, right? That's an important word. Uh, this is God uh, telling us what is true. Now, we all know this. God cannot lie. He cannot lie. Now, I could, get, I could say, I'm giving my testimony. I swear. And I could be lying to you. God cannot lie. Titus 1-2 says this, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Aren't you glad we're not just living a fairy tale like some claim that we are? You know, that we're not just living and we're just wasting all of our time trying to be Christian. Or as Paul said, as, as uh, men most miserable, right? <laughs> of all the men out there, we're, we're, we must be the most miserable ones, just believing this gospel, preaching this gospel, and it's all a lie, right? But he says, no, we know better than that. God can't lie, and we've got his word. And the Spirit, by the way, when you're saved, we just talked to a couple tonight that uh, I was talking about how hard it is to understand the Bible. And I said, now, look, it's never going to be just completely, you know, you just open it up and everything is just like this magical revelation that you just understand all things. I said, but at the same time, sometimes people don't understand the Bible because the Bible is spiritually discerned. And they're just still seeing things in the carnal mind and they're not getting it. But once the Holy Spirit moves in, His Spirit beareth witness with our spirit, right? And we believe, we read these things, we're like, yep, I testify, I know that's true, right? That's right, and, and, and it just bears uh, witness with us. So uh, Jesus and uh, His Word, God's Word, God cannot lie. Uh, man will lie. In fact, what did it say in Romans uh, 3? It said, let all men be liars, right? Amen. Let God be true and all men liars. Psalm 118, verse 8 says this, It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. Right? Amen. You don't put your confidence in man. He's going he's gonna to lie, but God can never lie. Look at John chapter 3. I like this verse here. The gospel according to John. John chapter 3. Look at verse 32 and 33. All right, John 3, 32. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. So when we receive, I should say it this way, to receive God's word is to claim or to just uh, confess that God's true. When we receive His Word, when we give the gospel to somebody and somebody says, I believe that, I receive that as the truth, They're, they are signifying, I believe God. I believe what the Word of God says. I believe His testimony. I'm not going to call Him a liar. Somebody rejects that in the same hand, uh, somebody rejects that, they're calling God a liar. That's right. And that's what the Bible says. Look at 1 John uh, chapter 1. Not uh, the Gospel of John, but 1 John. So it's back of the Bible. 1 John chapter 1. <clears throat> he actually uses this. Uh, Lord willing, Sunday morning, I'm going to start a series going through 1 and 2 and 3 John. But he says, he uses this terminology a lot. Look at verse 10. 1 John 1, 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Look, the Bible says all have sinned. They're an unrighteous. 
Somebody gets up here and says, well, I've never sinned. It, it doesn't happen a whole lot, but every once in a while you knock on a door and someone says, well, no, I've never sinned. <laughs> you liar. <laughs> and not only are you lying, you're making God a liar because God said we've all sinned. Right. And so the Bible says that for sure. And he says, if you say you haven't sinned, you're making God a liar. First John 2. In verse 22, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Amen. He is an antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Now, I don't care if they are good people, if they claim to be good, you know, if they keep commandments and they do all that kind of stuff. If they deny Jesus is the Christ, they are liars. That's right. And they're trying to make God a liar. And so we know uh, God's not a liar. 1 John chapter 5. 5. Similar thing here. 1 John 5, verse 12. He that hath the Son... No, let's back up to verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God, ha, not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. So look, if you don't believe in eternal life for those who have called upon the Lord, you're making God a liar. And his life is in the son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son, hath a uh, son of God hath not life. Okay, we love uh, uh, 1 John. And uh, boy, to say that God is wrong on these things is to call him a liar. Uh, just the other day, we were knocking on the door in, in Iola. The guy didn't seem very receptive. Uh, you know, it was one of those situations. You know, I got my own faith. I don't have to go to church. You know, I speak to God every day. And I said, oh, great. So you believe the Bible? Then he said, yeah, most of it. <laughs> said, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. You have to believe all of God's word or believe none of it. What's the point? What's the point of picking and choosing? I have people all the time, well, you know, some man wrote that. I'm like, yeah, well, some man read, wrote every book that you've ever read in your life, <laughs> you know, but this is God's word. This isn't just some book, right? And so uh, you have to either believe it or not believe it. So usually if somebody, if I stand at someone's door and I'm trying to give them the gospel and they say, nah, I don't really believe that, I'm probably just going to end up walking away, right? I mean, there's a, sometimes you say, well, can I just at least tell you uh, what it says. Maybe you've never heard this before and, and explain it to them. But a lot of times if they tell you, well, you know, some of those parts aren't inspired or something like that, usually you're talking with somebody who's rejected God's word. We have to receive it like a child, right? Receive the word like a child. You say, well, I don't understand those parts. I don't know what that means. Well, that's okay. You, know, you don't have to understand it. You just got to believe it. And so if we don't, then we're calling God a liar. In fact, the Bible says, look back at Romans chapter 3 again. No, that's not the right spot, but, uh, but that was where he says, uh, let God be true and every man a liar. Uh, what I was thinking of is the place where Paul says, if even an angel comes down from heaven, you know, don't, don't, don't believe it. Basically, what we see in the Bible is that we're supposed to receive God's word above just anything, anybody. You know, what I see with my own eyes, what I hear somebody say, whatever, uh, you know, I, I, can, I can question a vision. I can question if some kind of supernatural seeming experience happened to me and I say, no, you don't understand. Well, I know the Bible says that, but I can tell you what happened to me. No, I actually am supposed to believe the Bible over my experience. Right? Because otherwise, I'm calling God a liar. And I already know I'm capable of lying. I already know I'm capable of being deceived. I already know my heart is desperately wicked. you know. And so I have to just trust God. And it takes some faith. And God will reveal himself to you whenever you uh, begin to believe his word and trust it by faith. Okay, so, so God's testimony is really what's most important. God's testimony... Uh, is what he's revealed right here. It's his word. And if we don't receive that, we're making him a liar. But now let's talk about our testimony. Our testimony. Sometimes people will say, you know, uh, let, me show, let, me, let me say two things about this. Okay, Number one, we're going to talk about our testimony in the sense of what other people say about us. 
Because that's kind of our testimony too, right? Like we say, you got to, man, you got to watch your testimony. You know, people are watching you. You've got to watch your testimony. And so that's one sense of the word testimony. And then the other is when we give somebody our testimony, right? So there's two different aspects of this. God's testimony is right here, okay? It's written, it's revealed to us in His Word. Our testimony, let's look at this. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 5. There's several places where it uses this type of terminology. but By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Right? Now look, if people just went around and said... Uh, man, he, he, ple- he, he was a pleasing to God. He was a good guy. You know, he, he pleased God. I'm not necessarily going to take their word from it, but actually, if you go back to Genesis where it talks about him, God says he was a good man and he walked with the Lord. Okay, So God's testimony is, is stronger than other man's testimony. But look, he had this testimony. Right? Enoch you know, was known as that guy that walked with the Lord. He pleased God. All right. So what other people say about us, you know, should be based on, hopefully they've seen some good things. You know, I understand that our, you know, going to heaven isn't based on the works that we do. We all understand that, right? But shouldn't we be living right? I mean, this is why people get so confused because they're saying, well, I just don't understand. I remember talking to that Paul Wise and he's like, uh, uh, you know, I believe he got saved. But then later on we went and talked to him and he's like, I just don't understand it. You know, I don't understand why... If somebody isn't living for God, why God would allow him to, to hold on to eternal life and, not, and to be saved? And I'm like, you're right. It's hard to fathom. But that's the, that's the grace that God's uh, bestowed upon us, you know. But so his confusion, though, is because he wanted to have a testimony of, man, that's a righteous guy. Boy, that is a great man that can really preach the word of God. And look, he lives a clean life and all those kinds of things. And this is what a lot of people are looking for. They're like, man, I just want to have a good testimony. I want to be, have a good name for myself. And, and we should have a good name for ourselves. We should have a good testimony, right? That's just not part of our salvation. But wouldn't it be ridiculous to get saved and then just go off having a bad testimony and living in sin and living, you know, like we're not Christians? Who knows who we're causing to fall away because they're looking at us and saying, oh, that's what Christians are doing, you know? What's the difference? I already do that. And they might not even seek the gospel because of our testimony. We don't know. We've got to guard our testimony. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. Back a couple books there. 1 Timothy chapter 3. <clears throat> Another way of having a good testimony would be saying uh, uh, having a good report. Okay, 1 Timothy 3, 7. It's talking about the qualifications of a pastor. And it says, moreover, verse 7, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You know, and I've brought this up a lot lately. I don't know if it was here or Iola or both, but the Bible talks about how a wife you know, can win over an unbelieving husband. If a wife is a believer and she's living right and she's doing right by what God tells her to do and she's submissive to her husband and all that, her unbelieving husband could get saved. And the same is true if you're a servant and your boss at work is watching you and he knows you're a Christian, but he sees you doing right, living godly, being in subjection to your authorities to the best of your ability and living a righteous life, that could actually help lead him to the Lord by watching your testimony. Say, oh, that's lifestyle evangelism. Well, no, I, I believe in order to get somebody saved, we have to preach to them the gospel, the word of God, right? That's the testimony that matters, not, not what I say, not the way I live my life. The testimony that matters is what does God's word say. But by watching us, people might be drawn more to the Lord. Or they might at least believe you when you start preaching the gospel instead of them saying, no, 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 I know how you live, right? I don't, uh, I don't think that you're telling the truth. Uh, they are watching our testimony. Uh, those who are watching, you know, they're just waiting for you to mess up. You ever notice that? They're waiting for you to do something wrong so they can say, aha. I remember as a kid uh, in, in high school, 
uh, I said, shoot. And somebody, and I, and I even taught, we even taught our kids not to say that because it's like stay away from the appearance of evil. Somebody might think you said something else. And certainly in high school, I remember everybody knew me. And I'll tell you right now, I had a rebellious streak and I fell into sins and stuff. I'm not saying I was some perfect little teenager, but I remember trying not to cuss and trying to be an example to some of the people that I went to school with. And they always knew that hey, he doesn't drink, he doesn't go out and party with us, he doesn't uh, do these different things, and he doesn't cuss. And they were always trying to talk me into going out with them, hey, we want to get you drunk. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And they were always trying to get me to do different things, trying to get me to cuss. And that time that I said, shoot, someone said, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what Brother Rocky said? I mean, they didn't say Brother Rocky. <laughs> did you hear what Rocky said? <laughs> He cussed, and I'm like, no, I didn't, no, I didn't. But see how silly that is? But we have to watch our words. We have to watch our behavior. We have to watch the things we do. We have to try to live above reproach. Now, we're all sinners. I'm not saying we're not. We're all going to mess up, right? I'm not saying that we just become perfect when we get saved. But we must work on our testimony because people are watching us. And, uh, and they're, you know, I remember this. It's kind of overused, but I remember growing up, an independent Baptist church is a lot of uh, a phrase that was used a lot was say, you might be the only Bible that anybody ever reads, <laughs> somebody ever reads. And that's kind of silly. OK, again, we have to give them the we have to give them the gospel, God's word. But what they're saying is people out there aren't interested. Some, there are people out there not interested in God. But whenever they begin to watch your life, they should say, well, what's a Christian supposed to look like? And I'm going to tell you right now, the majority of Christians out there in the workplace, how many work with some so-called Christians, and you look at them and say, they sure look just like the world and act just like the world. They don't look any different to me, right? Well, the Bible says, you know, we're supposed to be representing Christ and living godly and being holy and set apart, separate from the world, okay? So, so there's a testimony that we have, somebody's testimony, you know, uh, does he have a good testimony? And that's something we should be guarding as our testimony. But then there's also the testimony that we give. All right? When we uh, testify, right, we are giving a witness. We are explaining uh, something about uh, the Lord, the record of the Lord. And, and, and again, once again, so here's what matters. I could be lying to somebody. What matters is the Word of God. So really, even when I'm giving my own testimony, what does it profit for me to spend all the time talking about how marvelous of a change that I've had in my life, you know, or how I used to do these certain things and I don't do those anymore? You know, any kind of testimony we give should be directed to the Bible. And I've discovered this truth in the Bible. It says, and then we give somebody that testimony. We say, you know, God, uh, God saved me because the Bible says blah, blah, blah. Always bring them back to the Bible. And this is something that I grew up kind of struggling with because I felt like, and I, I do agree with this, like, like the blind man said, you know, I don't know. The only one thing I know is that I was blind and now I see. And so I remember saying, even kids, they don't know why, you know, they don't know how to say all the right things to get somebody saved. They don't have all the scriptures memorized, but they can at least give their own testimony. Yeah, but when we give our testimony, if it's lacking the Word of God, it doesn't mean anything, right? right. So our testimony has to bring people to uh, the Bible. So I remember going through this one soul-winning course. I don't remember where it was or anything like that, and I'm not even saying that it was a bad course. But one of the things that they said is write down your own personal testimony. And uh, you want to be able to tailor that and get that just right so that when you're out preaching to somebody, you can give them your testimony. And I still to this day fall back on that a lot. I said, well, when I was an eight-year-old kid, I did it. Now, that could be effective. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't ever use personal examples. But I'm saying if I just tell them my experience, that doesn't mean anything to them. they got to be brought back to the Word of God. That's what I'm trying to get at. All right. Paul was a great example of this. <clears throat> You can read several places. I don't have any of them marked to go to, but you can read several places where Paul is writing a letter or maybe he's standing before a council, you know, that's judging him. And he begins to give his testimony, you know, how how he was persecuting Christians. And then Jesus came to him on the, uh, you know, in, in, in a bright light there. And he begins to give his testimony. A lot of times he uses that personal example about his testimony. Not only that, but even whenever he's talking to believers, he gives us personal testimony about how he had to go through great perils. You know, he was at sea and, and he went through fastings and, and all these kinds of things. He gives us testimony. 
that's not wrong. I think that's good because we can relate to what we've gone through ourselves and we can tra translate that to somebody else. But we always have to bring them back to the Bible. Probably the best example that I can think of, you know, kind of closing with this is in Revelation. Revelation. Look at the first chapter there, Revelation 1, verse 2. All right, let's just start at the beginning. This is the preface to the, to the book here. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. All right, blessed is he that readeth. And he goes on, but I thought that was kind of an interesting scenario, because you got John, who's giving testimony, right? We're receiving, when we read this, we're receiving John's testimony that he got when he received an angel's testimony, who was giving the testimony of Jesus, right? And so you, you see this all goes back to the testimony that was given by God. God's word, right, is passed down, and then, uh, and then he receives that, and then he tells us, and we're basically believing God's word, okay? Now look at verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation... And in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what I think he's saying there is that he was banished to the isle of Patmos because he was testifying of Jesus Christ. Because of his testimony, he was boldly preaching that he believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he believed that, and so therefore he was being persecuted. If that's not the case for John, which I, I definitely think that was the case, whether or not that's exactly what that verse means, it certainly is the case for many other who received persecution. Paul himself, you know, why was he getting the persecution? Because of his testimony. And he kept giving his testimony, and he kept saying, hey, I believe in the resurrection. I believe in Jesus Christ. And, and he was confessing uh, who Christ was. Look at chapter 6 now, Revelation chapter 6. Several places in Revelation. We'll just look at this last one. So not only was uh, John persecuted for giving his testimony, uh, in the tribulation, Christians will be killed for their testimony. Chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And so I believe that we will, until Jesus comes, you know, and we're going to go through persecution, different times, variations of persecution, until the great tribulation, right? And God's people are going to be proclaiming their testimony. Not just their own testimony and the experience they had. Some light, great light came down or, or whatever. They were healed in a supernatural way. But the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. And they'll continue to hold on to that. And I don't know how it's going to happen, but somebody's going to say, Oh, yeah, you're going to, you sure you want to share that? Because you're about to get your head cut off. And you say, Yeah, I want to share that because that's my testimony. And that's God's testimony. Okay, And we're boldly proclaiming the word of God. We ought to have our testimony and, uh, and uh, boldly uh, preach that for others, not for glory or fame. You know, sometimes that's the case. You get the big uh, evangelist uh, revival type preachers. A lot of times it's all built on their testimony. You know, they got this testimony how they were an alcoholic and then God changed their life. And, and now they're living for the Lord and now they're preaching against sin and all this kind of stuff. And, and everyone's coming down the aisle saying, oh, I confess, you know, I'm going to go home and pour all my alcohol down the drain and all that kind of stuff. And you're thinking, look, if they're basing all of their faith on this man's testimony, they're sunk. <laughs> Their faith needs to be on the Word of God, right, in the gospel that God proclaims. But look, we all have a testimony, and we all need to proclaim that testimony and be uh, faithful to do that. All right, that's the end of that. But that being said, uh, next preaching assignment. It's been a little while. <laughs> okay. 
I was actually going to do this uh, a while back, and uh, before, uh, uh, actually, Brother Dan was going to be the first one up. He's going to give his personal testimony, and then my assignment was to give your testimony and then uh, use that to go into preaching the Bible, something from the Bible. That doesn't have to be salvation testimony. It could be a te testimony of something God has done uh, in your life. You know, maybe uh, maybe it'd be fitting this, something that God's done even through this group of, of, of guys or whatever. But remember, it's going to go back into preaching from the Word of God. It's not just about your testimony. But I think the testimony would be a good springboard. It'd help us to, to know your testimony and, uh, and then to also, uh, you know, take that and to apply it to the scripture. Of course, he had talked about, uh, Brother Dan had talked about taking his from the aspect of mental health and all that kind of stuff and renewing your mind and all that. And I thought that'd be a great. Uh, so anyway, very vague, not a lot of information, but I want you to, the guys who are interested in preaching, you can let me know if you're interested and we'll work you in the schedule uh, down the road. But something about giving your testimony, something that's a testimony, you're, you're bearing record of something, and then bringing us to the, uh, uh, the scripture, which is the testimony, right? God's testimony. Uh, anyway, questions on that? You can ask me afterward. Okay, go ahead. Good question, good question. Uh, my original plan was to go ahead and do the whole service now. So everyone's pretty got experienced now, I think. You've done 15 minutes, half hour. If someone wants to preach but they say, I can't do the whole thing, then we'll work, we'll work you in, get two, maybe two people in one service. My plan was just to set you for a, a certain, uh, you know, you get, you get up here, we still do the announcements and do all that, and then turn it over to you, and you preach the whole message. So sound good? All right. Well, let's pray, uh, let's pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you for your word. That is the, your testimony. And we receive it, Lord, even when we don't understand it. And we certainly would never want to call you a liar. We know you cannot lie. And uh, we receive your word. I pray you help us to boldly proclaim it. We thank you for our own salvation uh, testimony. And the testimony, Lord, bearing witness that, uh, of the things that you've done in our life through your word and through the power of the gospel and through... Uh, the witness that you've given us, Lord. I, I, I just pray that you'll help us to even be willing, uh, as the day might be drawn very close, I don't know, but be willing to lay down our lives that we might boldly give the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, Lord, all the way up to the end. I pray you help us do that. Help the guys that uh, decide to take on this preaching challenge. I pray that you'll give them the right message and speak to their heart. They know what to preach and that you'd bless it. And I know that we'll all be edified from it, Lord. I pray that you'll bless now in Jesus' name. Amen.